The violence raging in northern Mexico hit closer to home last weekend when a pregnant U.S. consulate worker and her husband were shot dead in Juarez across the border from El Paso. There were more than 2,600 killings in Juarez alone last year. And joining us now, the Mexican ambassador to the United States, Arturo Sarukin. Mr. Ambassador, welcome back to the Situation Room. Thank you, Wolf. As you know, a lot of Americans are nervous right now about letting their kids, their college students, go to Mexico, Cancun, or other places on spring break, uh, given the violence that's going on. How worried should they be? Well, I think that whenever people travel abroad, you have to exercise caution. Precaution is necessary. But what's going on in Mexico and being concerned about the violence in Ciudad Juarez and sending your kids to Cancun is saying that you're concerned because there was a hijack or a mugging in New Orleans and you're going on holidays to New York City. Um, there are pockets of violence in, in certain parts of Mexico, but those patterns are not replicated in places like Cancun or the Riviera Maya. But there are areas of Cancun, uh, maybe not necessarily where the young Americans stay, but not that far away where there could be some trouble. We have not seen any incidents of drug-related violence in places like Cancun or Cabo San Lucas, which are obviously two of the hottest destinations in Mexico. What happened in Juarez? You're talking about Juarez. Some American diplomats, were they targeted because they were Americans shot down and killed? We are still in the middle of the investigation. The initial uh, findings seem to suggest that these three individuals that were associated with the consulate in Ciudad Juarez were not necessarily targeted because they were working for the consulate. Now what is behind the murder of these individuals is still unclear, but I hope that in the next 24, 40 hours we'll have more information on that. It, it seems like the drug cartel in Mexico is taking all sorts of drastic action right now. The kidnappings, the murders, the violence, it seems to be getting worse on a daily basis. I know that it sounds counterintuitive and it will sound counterintuitive to your viewers, but there is a direct correlation between increased violence and the fact that these groups are feeling squeezed and cornered. They're lashing out because they're losing. They're lashing out because they're trying to control the last remaining routes of drugs into the U.S. And we've seen a bit of that taking place over the past three years. We, we've also seen the president of Mexico, President Calderon, he's taking steps using the military, Mexican Marines and others, to go into some of these communities and basically take charge of local police responsibilities because the police are corrupt. We, we've had, obviously, an, an, a very important challenge in Mexico, which is that corruption, fest, corruption festered for so many years that only the armed forces could be used as stopgap measure by the president to initially take them on and push them back, and that's what the president has done, to create those breathing spaces where they, then you can move in and rebuild communities and ensure that the rule of law is prevalent. How prevalent is this corruption among local law enforcement in Mexico? I don't want to quantify, but it's a big challenge. A huge challenge. I think it's a very big challenge. And President Calderon and his government, are they on top of it? I think, I think that you, what you're seeing in Mexico is, for the first time, a Mexican president committed to taking it back, to taking, take, taking it on and pushing it back. What, if anything, can the United States do to help in a situation like this? Well, I think, I think that this administration and the previous administration have been uh, committed to uh, finding new ways to cooperate with Mexico. The key challenge for us right now, uh, Wolf, is to ensure that guns and money, bulk cash, which feed into the drug syndicates, don't cross from the U.S. into Mexico. Is it still crossing in? It is, it is. Is that the biggest problem right now? The demand here for drugs, the, the demand for, if you will, the, the revenue from the, from the guns? Well, there's always, there's always a connection between a consumer nation like the United States living next to a country that has become the platform for a significant amount of drugs coming to the, into, into the United States, in the same way that the availability of guns or of laundering operations on the side of the border are seeping into the drug operations in Mexico. You need two to tango, you need two to win, and at the end of the day, we will succeed or we will fail together. We've seen, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a recent reduction in illegal immigration, illegal border crossing, from Mexico into the United States. A, is that true? And if it is, why? There has been an important uh, drop, uh, especially in 2009. Most of it is directly linked to the global recession, the lack of jobs, and the unwillingness to cross over uh, if you can't uh, find a job in the U.S. market. So it's mostly there's no jobs it's here? Jobs. So it's it's, it's a jobs-driven problem. Uh, getting back to the uh, safety of tourism uh, in Mexico right now, bottom line is, uh, 
is the level of American tourism to Mexico going down based on, because a year ago when we, you were here in the Situation Room, you, we were all worried about swine flu in Mexico, and that was causing a dramatic reduction. What about the violence right now? So far, the numbers that we have seen, both as a result of Mexico and the United States' ability to take on H1N successfully, um, is that we have seen a very important rebound in tourism numbers in Mexico. Uh, occupation rates both in Cancun and Cabo San Lucas, for example, are at the level that they used to be uh, in these same periods in previous years. So far, we have not seen a direct impact of this on occupancy rates in hotels in Mexico. Ambassador, good luck to you. Thank you, Wolf.